Well, thank you so much to Washington Speakers Bureau for putting this conversation together. I think it'll hit on a lot of uh, inspiring and important topics as we're in uncharted, unfamiliar, uh, a moment in history that none of us could have planned for or foreseen, but we are here now. So very grateful to WSB for this conversation today. My name is Shannon Bream. I'm the anchor of Fox News at night and also the chief legal correspondent covering the Supreme Court for Fox News. So let's get to our distinguished guests now that we have with us tonight. Or today, I'll start with Admiral William H. McRaven. I am pleased to introduce him. He is a Navy four star admiral and former chancellor of the University of Texas system. Admiral McRaven is a recognized national authority on U.S. foreign policy, having advised presidents and U.S. leaders on defense issues, including development of the plan and leading the Osama bin Laden mission in 2011. He's received multiple accolades for his leadership, including the Judge William H. Webster Distinguished Service Award and the Intrepid Freedom Award. Drawing on his lifetime of service, he educates audiences on the value of teamwork, personal accountability, resilience, and leadership, and also on making your bed. And he's one of the reasons I do it every morning. Check out his best-selling book on that and his inspiring commencement speeches on those as well. Thank you so much to Admiral McRaven for joining us. Also today, our other distinguished guest, Admiral James Stavridis. They are both retired admirals. Uh, Admiral Stavridis is an operating executive of the Carlisle Group, following five years as the 12th Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. A retired four-star officer in the U.S. Navy, he led the NATO Alliance in global operations from 2008 to 2013. As Supreme Allied Commander with the responsibility for Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, counter-piracy off the coast of Africa, and cybersecurity earned more than 50 medals, including 28 from foreign nations in his 37-year military career. Admiral Sabridis, we thank you for joining us as well. We'll get started with some of the questions we have today, but I also wanted to start with something that Admiral McCraven wrote a short time ago. He put this in the context of Hell Week for becoming a Navy SEAL, where you're pushed to your absolute limits in every area, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. I'm going to read something that I think a lot of people probably need to hear right now. That nothing in our immediate future will be easy. The number of cases will rise. The losses will increase. The markets will stumble. But make no mistake about it, we will prevail because the only thing more contagious than a virus is hope. We're all up to our necks in the mud and it's time to start singing. Admiral Craven, how do you find hope in this moment? Yeah, thanks. Uh, first, Shannon, it's great to be here with, uh, with you and my good friend, Jim Stavridis. So thanks for hosting us here today. You know, I think all of us that have been in crisis situations over the years, and uh, and Jim and I have uh, have experienced a lot of those. You realize that as a leader, you always have to make sure that the folks that work for you, uh, your employees, the rank and file, the troops, understand that there is always hope out there. And uh, and if anything about my experience in the military has shown me that we can get through these crises if we pull together. Uh, if we have a plan and we execute that plan, there is always hope. And today, when you look at the great scientists that are working on this, there's a lot of hope out there. So uh, I'm not worried that we will get through this. We will get through this. And uh, it, there are going to be some tough times ahead. Make no mistake about it. There's so much uncertainty because we're getting new data every day. It gives us new predictors. The models change. But right now for organizations, whether they're military, whether they're civilian, whether it's a house of worship, a school, a family, um, people have a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, what are the qualities of leadership? Well, let me uh, echo Bill and saying uh, wonderful to be with you and, and with this audience. I think we've got like a thousand people listening to this. Um, that's uh, wonderful to have a, a platform to talk a little bit about all this. And I'll tell you three things that I think are important in this time, taking uh, agreement with everything Admiral McRaven just said. First is stay informed be tactically aware of what's going on. Watch the evening brief that the president does. Whether you are politically in his camp or not, he's the president. Listen to what he has to say. Above all, listen to those experts like Dr. Townley Fauci and Deborah Bricks. We've got to stay informed. Number two, stay physically fit, uh, work out, engage, get out of the house, take a walk, no matter what your circumstances are. I've always found in crisis that uh, working hard to stay fit is really, truly important. And then uh, thirdly, uh, to kind of pick up Bill's point, um, Colin Powell, who is a mentor of mine, someone I know Admiral McRaven respects a lot as well, often says, uh, optimism is a force multiplier. In other words, that 
that sense that we're going to do this together uh, matters. And by communicating that with each other, even if it's only waving at the FedEx guy as he goes by or telling your postal delivery worker that she's doing a great job, uh, share that positive attribute as best you can from six feet away. Um, all those things are, are tactical thoughts. And I'll close on this with a quote. And I love to quote Napoleon. I'm only 5'5". Five five. And uh, my good friend, Bill McCravens, I think 6'1". I, I was always around these big, tall admirals and generals. So I love to quote Napoleon. Um, Napoleon said, a leader is a dealer in hope. A leader is a dealer in hope. Those are good words for our time. And I stand with Bill McCraven in there. I agree. Okay, so let's talk about some of the international implications now, because uh, there's a lot of speculation about how China and or Russia may be trying to capitalize on what's going on in the world. A piece in the Hill says this, um, it's not that piece, uh, about China and its role. It says, make no mistake, the Chinese are manipulating the coronavirus outbreak as the perfect opportunity to make themselves look like the good guys, undermine the role of the U.S. as a global first responder and emerge as a world superpower in a way that nobody would have foreseen. Craven, what do you think about this um, you know, tense relationship we have with China? We've been trying to hammer out trade deals. The WHO is in the middle of this thing, um, but it's clear that China is using, um, by many studies, attempts at disinformation. Uh, our USS Health uh, agency says that they are not giving us the full picture about actually what's happened. How are we to deal with that relationship in this moment? You know, interestingly enough, I'm not overly concerned about China or Russia in this moment. Uh, and, and while I know there are a lot of these theories out there that they are using the coronavirus to advance their, uh, you know, their ideology and, and their philosophy and, and their interests, I think the bigger issue is the vacuum that we are creating by not having U.S. leadership out front and center. And so where there is a vacuum, it will be filled by China or it will be filled by Russia. So again, I don't think we ought to concentrate on what they're doing at this point in time. We certainly need to be aware of it. Uh, we need to have a plan to deal with it. But more importantly, we need to make sure that we are working with our allies, that we are continuing to build strong alliances, that we are doing everything possible to show that the U.S. can lead. The world wants the U.S. to lead. And if we are not leading, then I guarantee you the vacuum will be filled by somebody else. Admiral Stavridis, um, what is your concern about that calculation? I mean, the U.S. right now is trying to do so much to get things like PPE in the door um, here internally for our own medical personnel, gowns, all kinds of things. But at the same time, we have been shipping it to other countries. We're at a bit of a disadvantage in this moment. Um, but as Admiral McRaven said, we have to build those strong bonds with our allies and many of them need us right now. Yeah, I think these are two very different cases, by the way, China and Russia. Uh, Russia is a declinist power by any measure, uh, particularly as oil prices plummet. It's a population that's declining by about a million a year, uh, has high levels of alcoholism, underlying health conditions, doesn't begin to describe the problems in Russia, and its economy is a one-trick pony. It does oil and gas. That's about it. So, no, I don't lay awake at night asleep about uh, how Russia is going to manipulate this. Um, on the Chinese side of this equation, I think this is a moment for cooperation between the United States and China. And should we call out China if they are hiding figures? Absolutely. Should we be clear-eyed about the fact that this uh, virus originated in China? We should, and China should be as well. Um, having said that, we are at a much greater advantage if we can work together in this moment. And I think that um, this is Admiral McRaven's point. The United States can be a leading uh, entity here, but it's going to require working with China. And the problem is that we're in a very political season, newsflash. We have an election coming in November. It has a very polarizing effect. And I'm concerned that we may end up nationally turning China into a punching bag for this thing. That would not serve our interests well in the moment. Uh, bottom line, we need to energize our alliance systems, NATO, Japan, South Korea, uh, our Pacific allies, our European allies, work together with them and put that hand out to work with China. I think that will serve us best in the long term. I know that both of you have written and talked extensively about the very difficult decisions you've had to make away, along the way in your military careers, and you wouldn't be at the positions that you're at 
wouldn't have achieved that, um, you know, the four-star status had you not been forced to make really difficult decisions. There's been a lot in the news about the USS Roosevelt um, and the, the uh, commanding officer there, Captain Crozier, who spoke up. Um, he was relieved of command and now the acting Navy secretary um, who relieved him of command. Uh, he has now resigned and expressed regret over some of the words that he used and the way that that was handled. Um, Admiral Savridis, I've, I've read uh, what you wrote about this in recent days, so we'll start with you, but I'd love for you both to talk about how you handle an excruciating decision in the midst of a crisis that we're in. Well, to the Roosevelt situation, let's just start with an observation. There are no winners in this scenario. Um, this is a virus that hits a ship. First time any commander has experienced this. First time the chain of command has experienced this, certainly in modern times. Um, where the captain, I think, uh, did the right thing was in relentlessly pounding the chain of command to take immediate emergency uh, medical care of the crew to include pulling it offline, momentous decision to pull it off a forward deployment uh, and get that crew ashore in Guam. You can have an argument, you can have a legitimate discussion about whether he should have taken that argument into a public venue or not. Um, I think we need an investigation to understand why he felt he needed to do that. Um, having said that, the right decision was to take that ship offline because we're not in a combat situation right now. If we were in a war with a nation, for example, I'm sure that the captain would have kept his sailors on the crew, accepted the losses that would have entailed as the virus swept through the crew. But given that it's a young and healthy population, I think he could have fought the ship effectively. Um, so. I think given the peacetime circumstance, right decision to pull the ship offline. Um, as to Secretary Modley, I think his mistake in all this was getting very emotionally involved in the process and then flying to Guam, giving this uh, discussion on the ship's announcing system, uh, casting significant aspersions on the captain. That's a, not a good move either. So no winners in the situation. The bottom line is, we're going to see more of this because of the close quarters nature, not only on Navy ships, but in units in Afghanistan and a port deployed Army and Air Force. This is going to be a continuing challenge that the services are going to have to meet as this uh, as this unfolds. And Admiral McRaven, my last check on numbers this morning. I mean, the Navy, though not the largest branch, it seems at this point, probably because of these conditions, just the physical conditions that you have, uh, it's been hit the hardest so far, uh, and this, this this situation that has captured headlines um, has generated a lot of debate, um, but how do you move forward in this day and age with the circumstances that we have, knowing this may be a, a similar situation on other vessels out there? Yeah, well, well, first, let me uh, echo Jim Stavridis's uh, points about Captain Crozier and the way it was handled. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you, you have to make sure that your chain of command is informed. I think an investigation will, in fact, uh, determine whether or not Captain Crozier took the right steps uh, in terms of uh, did he inform the right uh, people in the chain of command? Did they react appropriately? And then why did he take it offline? And then uh, again, to uh, to Jim's point about Secretary Modley, uh, certainly could have handled it better. But but let me get to the the bigger question here, which is you know how does the military deal uh, with uh, you know pandemics and and viruses that are this kind of unseen enemy, if you will. You know, you can go back to the Revolutionary War. I mean, George Washington had to deal with smallpox. Uh, and, and what he understood was, I've got a mission to do. My mission is to defeat the British. If I'm going to defeat the British, I have to have a large enough force to be able to handle the problem set. And what did he do? He vaccinated all his men with smallpox. Well, well, back then, of course, the smallpox vaccine wasn't very good. And so a large portion of them died, but more of them were saved. Washington handled it as best he could under the circumstances. You take a look at the Civil War, typhoid, uh, took out about a third of the soldiers on both sides uh, as a result of that disease. You know, World War I, we had the flu. World War II, we had tropical disease. So the military has had to deal with similar things before. Um, and the way you deal with it is you understand what your mission is, you, you develop a plan, you make sure you keep the troops informed, uh, you rally them together because good leaders understand that the mark of a good leader is how to deal with uncertainty. Uh, you provide them confidence that you're going to get through these rough times, and then you move out. Uh, and again, the military does this and does this exceedingly well. There will be challenges. That's not to say that we won't have more Roosevelts, uh, that this problem won't pop up elsewhere. But I think the military will figure a way to continue to do the mission 
and deal with this uh, with this deadly pandemic at the same time. And the military is consistently, when the American people are asked and surveyed about institutions they respect the most, the military is always near the top of that list. And we're seeing them in action right now in so many different ways. I was going through the list today of the different ways they've stepped in on the front lines of COVID um, with the Navy ships, Mercy and Comfort, um, the Army Corps of Engineer and other groups stepping up to immediately stand up hospitals and convert spaces. It's an amazing thing to watch. Uh, General Stavri or excuse me, Admiral Stavridis, I mean, there are things the military can do, can't do, um, but they are showing us the very best of their willingness to step in and get these things done. Um, but there are sometimes people are confused about what the military would do, patrolling the streets, performing law enforcement operations, things like that. Um, Admiral Stavridis, give us a look at what they're doing right now, what they can do. Um, let's start with those two big, beautiful hospital ships, uh, Comfort and Mercy. When I was commander of U.S. Southern Command in charge of all military activities south of the United States, um, Comfort was part of my force. Um, I ordered her deployed throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. I embarked the ship. I, as we say in the Navy, I broke my flag. I flew my four-star flag over the Comfort. And in many ways, it was the most fulfilling deployment of my career because I got to watch um, militaries undertake that humanitarian mission. We did hundreds of thousands of patient treatments. Now we have a chance for that ship to come into the United States and be part uh, of this campaign. And it's a, a very visible signal. It had a, a little bit of a slow start in New York. Uh, now they're retooling the ship in order to take COVID-19 cases, which I think uh, is the right decision. And it, it's that a pretty good example, uh, Shannon, of the tension between the need for the military to maintain its health, to be able to do its military mission, but at the same time use its assets to help the population. So uh, hospital ships, flying uh, big Air Force tankers full of medical supplies. Um, we're now moving uh, medical equipment from state to state so it gets to the right place. Our National Guard is being mobilized. Important point here, they're not going in as soldiers under the Title 10 classic military role. They're going under what's called Title 32, not to get technical, but they report to the state governor. That means they can support law enforcement functions, but we're not doing martial law. They're gonna be delivering food, delivering water, setting up uh, clinics, setting up means to test people. Um, it's a manpower force. So I'll, I'll close by saying, Here's a good number to hold in mind. There are 1.2 million members of the armed forces active duty, 800,000 reservists, um, almost all of them young, fit, uh, motivated to serve. It's a tremendous resource for the country. I think you'll see the military continue to step up in the time ahead. And Admiral McRaven, how are they uniquely equipped here? When we're talking about logistics and supply chains and all the things that Admiral Stavridi said, um, they're just, listen, uh, this is what you're organized to do. This is what you're trained to do. And it seems like the best of America watching them do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, you take a look at every humanitarian disaster we've had here over the last several decades, whether they are hurricanes, tsunamis, typhoons, earthquakes, uh, the U.S. military invariably shows up on another country's doorstep to help them. Uh, and so we know how to do this. Every major exercise, we will bring the Air Force's Red Horse engineers out or the Navy Seabees out or the Army's uh, heavy construction battalions in order to build field hospitals. Uh, so this uh, sort of activity is something that the military does every day uh, in the real world and also uh, prepares for and trains for in all of our major exercises. So I think this will, this will come as a natural extension of what the military is used to doing day to day. And so many of those men and women are now um pulled into different duties or pulled up uh, many reservists as well and active duty. Um, families at home were always impacted by that. And we think about families in the civilian world, obviously impacted now too, many trying to work from home if they can, uh, others trying to homeschool all of a sudden, finding themselves um, trying to wrestle the kids into schoolwork they may not wanna do when they all wanna play and have a good time and pretend it's summer already. Um, any advice to the civilians out there about structuring our time, our working from home, our dealing with um, families and upheaval um, when there's so much uncertainty. Admiral Stavridis? Uh, well, I'll start by quoting Bill McRaven, uh, make your bed. I mean, in other words, organize your life. Um, take control of things that you can control. Uh, number two, so many resources available online. Um, have you always wanted to 
study another language? Um, have you wanted to uh, find out what the uh, what the prospects are for uh, for for international travel? Think beyond the current moment and hope you can prepare for it and use those online resources. Thirdly, you alluded to it, Shannon, but it's um, have a schedule. And I think that's particularly important with children. I've got two son-in-laws, by the way, who are both physicians. They're both on the front lines. One of them is running a big emergency room in Atlanta. The other one is a Navy flight surgeon uh, running clinics in and around the Washington area. Um, they both have young children. Getting a schedule is critical for them. And then uh, fourth and finally, figure out a way to serve somebody else during this time. If you have elderly neighbors and you're young and strong, be the one who goes to the grocery store for them. Um, help your neighbors, help um, other families uh, figure out how to work together on these things. Share, I mean, you've heard the expression, but I like it, corona kindness. Um, I think that's part of the antidote to all that. There's there's four ideas to think about. And Admiral McCraven, we have started with making our beds. Uh, everyone at home can, <laughs> can raise a hand or not if they've started there, but from there, Admiral, where would you go? No, I think Jim nailed it. I mean, the fact of the matter is all of us that have spent time in, you know, kind of military isolation, if you will, and I spent a lot of time on submarines. I've spent a lot of time on ships at sea. I did a 10-month a deployment during Desert Shield and Desert Storm, of which I was at sea for two four-month blocks. And, and when you're in a, a small stateroom with one other officer and you have a daily routine, the routines are important. So to Jim's point, uh, you know, in the military and in the Navy in particular, you get up every morning, you make your rack, you make your bed, you make sure your stateroom is clean. You have a routine. Routines are important. Cleanliness is important. And then, as Jim said, you find something uh, to make your daily activity worthwhile. So, again, uh, there's not much I can do to expand on what he said. But I do want to double tap one thing, which was this the sense of building a team. And whether it is with your families, uh, you know, we have. I have happy hours with uh, with my adult kids on Saturday. I have happy hours with uh, with some friends of mine, uh, former military colleagues. Uh, you know, we have an opportunity to get together with the community all online. And these community relationships, these building of the teams, whether it's families, coworkers, you know, neighbors, this is this is just absolutely critical for us to all get through this. Uh, and and again, uh, as Jim said, this Corona kindness is going to be essential as well. Yeah, and I hope, and I think so many do out there, that what we're learning through new technological ways to connect with each other and to see each other across the separation, um, the kindness to our neighbors, that all of those things, time with our family, um, really slowing down and focusing on what's important, that we hold, hope that that holds over as lesson um, from this whole time of the pandemic, but also um, bettering ourselves and our country uh, in the future because of these ways we've been forced to adopt some different habits they tend to be very positive. So let's hope we can all hold on to some of that. Of course, it occurred to me, Shannon, that maybe I'm having too many happy hours. <laughs> you know. I, Bill, I only heard that. three happy hours in there. Good. We're, we're going about four times a day, so don't, don't feel bad. It's, uh, as long as it's scheduled and part of a routine. Right. I mean, Absolutely. that's part of your plan for the day. So <laughs> take it where you can. Uh, Admiral Stavridis, I wanted to ask you too, because you had talked about in the context of what we're going through right now, some lessons from admirals you've written about in the past. And there were a couple that really um, stuck out. You talked about Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz and also uh, someone known as Amazing Grace, the Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. Um, tell us why you think of them and what lessons we can learn. Well, um, I, I wrote this book called Sailing True North, 10 Admirals and the Voyage of Character. And, and what it does is it talks about different qualities through the prism of 10 really short chapters that are snapshots of each of these admirals. Um, and they go back 2,500 years to the ancient Greeks. But I really like the two that you, you mentioned and brought up, and then I'm gonna add a third. Um, the, the first is Chester Nimitz, who of course took the US Navy through the Second World War. And what I love about Chester Nimitz was his resilience. Here's a guy who dreamed his whole life of becoming the commander of the Pacific Fleet, had put on his beautiful choker whites, we call them that beautiful white uniform, take command standing on the deck of a big battleship. That was his dream, except the whole fleet was sunk in Pearl Harbor. The battleships were sunk. The carriers were chased out of port. He, was, he took command of that fleet wearing a rumpled, oily set of khakis standing on a diesel submarine. And then he squared his shoulders to Bill McRaven's point. He built a team that created a plan and they defeated the Japanese empire. It's an extraordinary story. 
of many things, but particularly of resilience. The other admiral you mentioned, uh, amazing Grace, Grace Hopper, this tiny little woman, five feet tall, 104 pounds on Pearl Harbor Day, marches down to the Navy recruiting office and says, I want to join the Navy. And they say, uh, ma'am, you're too small. You don't weigh enough. She goes back and eats steaks and drinks milkshakes. It's a good problem to have. Puts on weight, finally becomes one of the first women officers in the Navy. But she's a brilliant mathematician, a PhD from Yale University in mathematics in the 19th. 30s, she got that PhD, think about that, what the barriers women faced at that time. And she invents the idea of programming computers. She effectively programs the first computer. She invents the language of COBOL. She's often referred to as the mother of COBOL. What I love about Grace Hopper to our current situation is she always had a smile on her face. She was kind of a practical joker. Um, people love to be around Grace Hopper. She was someone who liked her happy hours quite a bit, as a matter of fact. And, um, two delightful, delightful admirals. And I'm going to mention another admiral, and it's Admiral Bill McRaven, uh, who has overcome significant medical challenges in his life and career, including a near fatal fall from a parachute that went terribly wrong when he was on active duty to dealing with significant uh, challenges later on in life. He's my idol for resilience, for overcoming challenges. He's a living example of that as well. Well, I'm more craven. I was gonna say so many people look up to you and, and they do for your leadership, your example, all that you've been through, um, your colleague here saying it best for us, but are there those that you look to for inspiration and leadership? Oh, thanks, Shannon. I'm sorry, I was having a little technical difficulty there. Well, one, I, I appreciate uh, Jim's comments. And uh, as Jim knows, he and I have spent a lot of time over the last several decades, and uh, and candidly, uh, there are few people that I know, few officers that I know, uh, that are as talented, uh, as gracious, uh, and as as fabulous a leader as, as Jim Stavrida. So believe me, it's a a mutual admiration society here. Um, but you know, one of the things, as as he was talking about Grace Hopper there, uh, and others, you know, I've always told my junior officers, leaders can't have a bad day. You can't have a bad day as a leader. And I don't care whether you're the leader of your family, whether you're the, uh, the oldest sibling, whether you're the CEO of a company, or whether you're an officer leading 10 people or 10,000 people. The expectation is, as a leader, you know, you come in, your head is held high, you have a plan, you inspire the troops, uh, and you pull them together in a way that is meaningful to accomplish the mission. If, as a leader, you come in and you're whining or you're forlorn, or you're having a bad day, let me tell you, that, that attitude will go like wildfire uh, through the organization. And, and it's immaterial whether it is, again, uh, a military organization or my time as the chancellor at the University of Texas. You see that the really good leaders make sure when they walk in the room, they are upbeat, they have a plan, uh, they have inspired the, the troops, they have managed the plan well, and they execute the plan. Um, but you can't go in and again, your shoulders sloping down, uh, looking forlorn, looking like you're you're not in charge. If you do that, uh, things are probably not going to go too well for you. And can I just add to that, Shannon? That doing that is not only critical; it's really hard. It, it is. It, it it takes a lot out of you physically. And I remember in my destroyer command. Uh, we had a, a huge setback, an engineering examination that we failed miserably. And it was the hardest day of my life to, as Bill says, just square your shoulders, put a smile on your face. Well, I went home that night and, and literally cried and told my wife, Laura, my career's over. People gave me a second chance. I think part of the reason they gave me a second chance was I was able to maintain that sense of, okay, this is chaotic. Let's bring order out of chaos. That's what militaries really do. And, you know, so many people who are watching or listening in now are facing that because they're leaders of businesses, of operations, where they're having to face a lot of bad news. They may be struggling financially or know they're going to be very soon. They're having to lay people off and make really difficult decisions. So, um, you know, we think about how do you take this situation, which is going to be, you know, one of the hardest for many people who are out there in leadership positions, foster some creative thinking, get innovative, um, know that you build trust within your organization, 
there's going to be some risk taking how to do that smartly um, and, and how to manage this all in times of crisis and fear. Um, when you're looking at this from a business model, for a lot of people listening in, Admiral McRaven, we'll start with you. Yeah, well, first, I'll go back to something I said earlier, which is you have to understand the mission you are trying to accomplish. So, yeah, as simple as it sounds, if your mission is to keep your family together, then understand what that mission is. If your mission in the military is to you know, conduct operations in Afghanistan or Iraq or lead NATO, understand what the mission is. My time as the chancellor of the University of Texas, the mission was to educate the students. The mission was to take care of patients at MD Anderson, the UT Health. We had a large health enterprise. So I am watching the university now go through these, uh, these issues of, oh my gosh, now we can't bring folks back in because of the social distancing. How are we going to deal with this? Well, first and foremost, what is your mission? Your mission is to educate students. So in the military, we're big on planning. And so you have a base plan and your base, base plan says, okay, we're gonna go from A to B. Well, guess what? That's not working out too well. You have to have branches and sequels. Every plan has a branch and sequel. That is basically, hey, here's the worst case scenario, or here's something that could happen to us. How do we deal with that? And so when you build this plan, you, you have to understand that the enemy gets a vote. Chance and uncertainty and the will of the enemy are part of how you build a plan. In this case, the enemy happens to be COVID-19. But we recognize very early on at the University of Texas, okay, we're going to have these problems with COVID-19. We still have a mission to do. The mission is to train and to, to educate the students. So now start building the plan to educate the students with all this uncertainty happening around you. It's really not as complicated as it sounds, as long as you don't take your eye off the ball with respect to what your mission is. If you begin to think your mission is other things, then your plan will start to fall apart because it'll have so many branches and sequels, you can't manage it. Uh, in terms of risk, I think you, you always find that, uh, that the military does, does wonderfully when we are in a time of crisis. Um, and you do well in a time of crisis because that's when you are the most innovative. Uh, you know, we have found if you study military history, it's generally not during the interwar years that we do well. It's when we're in the middle of a crisis and lives are at stake that we innovate better than ever. And one final thing I'll say is there's always this uh, belief that, you know, we in the special operations community that we're a little bit cavalier, we kind of grab our gun and, and we run off to conduct a mission. Nothing could be further from the truth. One of the things that makes the special operations community so good at what we do is we build extensive plans, then we rehearse those plans, and then we execute those plans, you know, based on everything we have done. So when we start looking at a plan for a business, you know, build the plan, war game the plan, build the branches and sequels, and then rehearse the plan, then go execute the plan, and then be prepared for all the uncertainties that will come with that. And Admiral Stavridis, I mean, that idea of there is so much uncertainty right now, being able to pivot and be flexible in your leadership and what you expect of your business. Uh, how do you begin to tackle that? I'd say three things that, that work at a time like this are really important, and I'll, I'll just hit each of them very quickly. Um, first one's pretty obvious, and that's communication. I think good leaders have to be good communicators, and that means using technical means to communicate, especially now you can't exactly gather your work center together, or gather your company together 2000 strong down in Austin to take a look at things. You've got to do it in somewhat awkward means like this, but communication and using all the technical ways you possibly can. The second one is collaboration and team building within the organization. So look within your organization, no matter how small it is or how big it is, and think about where are the logical places I can create teams inside here because human beings love teams. They love to work together. Um, it's a rare person who really is that lone wolf. And then lastly, to your the root of the question about innovation, I think uh, we've hit on a number of things, but I'll give you two others that haven't been mentioned. One is the idea of um, creating an innovation cell within your organization. And here I'm talking, you know, kind of mid to large size organizations. But look around your organization and find the two or three really bright people, bring them together, give them some resources, create that, that small innovation cell, give it access at the very top. That can be very helpful. I've used that model in a number of different places. It's quite good. And then another obvious one is incentivize innovation. Within a business context, this means um, offering rewards for those who come up with new ideas. Um, it's not self-evident, even in a time like this, 
that people will let go of what they've been doing. In fact, in a time like this, many people clutch to the old way of doing business. It is that we are forced to try these new things. So incentivize it with bonuses, with uh, pay increases, with promotions, with a, a spot on that innovation. So find ways to uh, incentivize innovation. I think that's a, a practical thought. Thank you. Yeah, I think all of us are forced out of our comfort zones right now. And you know we do uh, discover new ways to get things done, to communicate, to connect, uh, to carry forward because we're forced to. Um, points you both have made uh, very well. Now, every country deals with this differently. And even within the US, states deal with this differently where we have a you know, system of federalism. So governors have a lot of power, a lot of control over the decisions they make state by state and how they're going to roll things out and handle things. Um, but the US is a place where people really love their freedom. And there have been concerns that Americans wouldn't want to go along with some of these crackdowns, although there are some early signs that maybe we're seeing finally, uh, there is a little bit of hope of a flattening of a curve or that we may be getting to that peak and, and going over to the next uh, phase of this. Um, in the meantime, Avril Stavrid, as you wrote, the key will be finding the balance between draconian medical responses to address the threat to the elderly and the impact doing so will have on the economy, which will create a serious threat to the young. This now seems to be the growing conversation about how we begin to think about how we will restart the economy or communities while balancing the medical and health concerns as well. Yeah, let me take it from a leadership perspective. I'm certainly no physician, but um, I think that the, the essence of coronavirus is that medically it attacks the elderly, economically it's attacking the young. And that creates a difficult set of choices for leaders. And the mistake leaders often make, particularly in crisis situations, is gravitating relentlessly towards solving one axis of the problem. So the example here would be just open up the economy again and recognize that you're going to have a one to two million dead, but the economy will come roaring back. Um, I think that's not the right choice. On the other hand, you could say, and I've seen uh, British epidemiologists say, lock down everything for 12 to 18 months. I think that's not feasible. So we've got to kind of dial it in. And I think that's what good leaders do. They make compromises. At the end of the day, when you make a decision, if everybody's a little bit unhappy with what you're doing, you're probably in roughly the right place. So my advice to our leaders and the folks that I'm talking to, both in the business world and my current work at the Carlisle Group, as well as uh, in, the, uh, in the military and in the government through my connections there, is let's find the balance. And I, I think we're moving in that direction. And, and I'm, I'm going to close by saying in a very bipartisan way, um, I think the governors, by and large, are really stepping up to this. And on the one hand, I think Governor Cuomo, who is in the hot seat, the epicenter, so to speak, is doing a very good job in communication, using very clear graphics, talking every day. That's the kind of thing you want to see. Um, I think that on the Republican side, look at Governor Baker up in Massachusetts, a Republican governor in a largely Democratic state, but boy, he's been a tower of leadership up there. Same kind of thing. And you're really seeing governors, I think, across the country do a pretty good job of this because they are going to be the ones who are going to be the best at dialing that reestat between those two extremes. Yeah, and because every state has such different concerns and needs uh, and problems as they see playing out, and the peak productions that came out this morning from the primary model, a lot of people are following the White House uh, out of University of Washington, that Murray model, shows us different peaks for different states. Uh, and Admiral McRaven, they'll be coming at different times on the calendar. So there's a lot of autonomy for those governors to handle the situation as they hit their peaks and have, hopefully flatten their curves. Um, but it also gives, as each state is sort of the petri dish, guidance to other states to learn lessons from them as, as they may be in a different place on the curve. Um, but this idea of returning to a medically sound uh, society and, and, and economically sound as well, Admiral McRaven, Many times these are being presented as a binary choice, but as your colleague says, um, there is a way to find compromise. Although the two different groups, the medical and the, econ um, the economist, they may not exactly agree on, on how this thing comes together. How do we get to that point of consensus? Yeah, I don't know whether we ever get to that point of consensus. I think, uh, I think you hit an e equilibrium at some point in time. As, as Jim said, this balance between taking care of the elderly and making sure the economy 
stay strong for the young is this uh, is a very difficult choice. I, I think the way to deal with this, though, and where I, I believe we're coming around now, but you know, there has been this a little bit of a disconnect between the federal government and the state and local governments. And so as the federal government seemed to uh, to get off to a little bit of a slow start, Obviously, the governors had to step up, and as Jim mentioned, a number of them, a lot of them have. Uh, not only uh, the governors have, but you see it at the mayoral level, uh, at the city council level, uh, and so so locals have stepped up. But let's not forget, we are the United States of America. So I believe that you have to have a a federal plan that recognizes you know the rights of the states but that there's got to be an overarching federal plan because as this virus moves from you know, New York to Louisiana to, to Texas to pick a place, we've got to have a plan that recognizes how we're going to redistribute the resources we have. Uh, and so if you don't have a, an overall federal plan, I think it complicates uh, the governor's ability to, to manage their crisis. So absolutely, uh, the governors have got to step up. They've got to deal with, the, with their particular states. but I think we just need to make sure that we've got a good balance between the federal and the, the state and local plans. We've all talked about the use of technology right now, having our virtual happy hours and seeing our families. People are using it for work. I know we're doing almost everything virtually online, all of our meetings, and it does help to see each other. But now there are concerns being raised about uh, the various platforms that we're using, um, questions of cybersecurity and uh, technological advancements in security. Um, so to both of you, uh, and I'll start with you, Admiral McRaven, what do you make of us needing to look forward and be aware of cyber threats, cybersecurity, as so much of what we're doing now is winding up online? Yeah, I was reading an interesting article uh, uh, by Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. And, and of course, his take on this was that at the end of uh, this long, uh, you know, tough period, that big tech is going to come out stronger than ever. And I think there's probably some truth in that because you're going to begin to see that Again, we're all Zooming or we're all web chatting. Uh, Amazon has figured out a way to deliver things differently, whether it is online videos, uh, you know, Apple and Google. And, and so we will find the, the rise of tech, I think, will be even steeper than before. So, I, and I'm not sure that's a bad thing. It's just something I think we need to take into consideration. And obviously, as these things begin to expand and we find different ways to work from home, different ways to collaborate within the office, we are going to have to be dealing with cyber in a way that we've never done before. Jim Stavridis uh, is one of the true experts we have in the military on cyber, and I know he can address that. But every time you have, uh, you know, a, a, an incremental or an exponential rise in tech, you better be prepared to balance that with an exponential rise in your cybersecurity. Yeah, so Admiral Stavridis, to that point, uh, good that we have an expert on hand. Uh, your thoughts on cybersecurity in this uh, current age? Yeah, I've been very deeply focused on this for uh, well over a decade, and I'll put the threat in three baskets very quickly. One is um, cyber criminal activity. This is an enormous, enormous business. Um, the global economy is about $80 trillion, about $1.2 trillion a year of cyber criminal activity. In the chaotic seams that are emerging right now, uh, there will be great opportunity for that kind of uh, destructive work. Number two is national security. Uh, from our perspective, China, Russia here are both highly capable actors. Um, they will find ways to uh, go through different channels that are opening up now as a result of the need for everybody to be online. And they will also find ways to manipulate images to create real fake news, if there's such an expression. Uh, there is a real chance of national activity from other state actors we ought to be concerned about. And third and finally, um, this will open up uh, means for political activists who want to uh, come online, post embarrassing videos, crack into Zoom meetings of Fortune 500 companies, take embarrassing snippets, post them online, um, all of those things are quite real, and we ought to be concerned about them. Um, I could literally talk for an hour. I'll just close by making a, a point, and it's about these supercomputers we all carry around. Um, today, there are about 25 billion devices connected to the Internet. That's quite extraordinary. There are 7 billion people on Earth, 25 billion devices connected. And that's great, right? I can pick up my phone and open my garage door, turn off my oven that I forgot to, et cetera. The bad news is 
it's an enormous threat surface. And that threat surface is expanding exponentially in a period like this because of all these activities from those three actors. This is, I think, the next big topic. When we get through pandemic, it's going to be a wave of cybersecurity activity we need to be prepared for. And there are also broader questions, too, about how, you know, there are all kinds of national security issues that are implicated here, but also supply chain issues. Uh, I think the average American had no idea that 80% of U.S. pharmaceuticals in some way come through China, at least ingredients or formulation or something related to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, there are all kinds of supply lines when it comes to automobiles, technology, medicines, food. Um, you know, I, I put the question to both of you. How do you think that this pandemic could change, should change, shouldn't change uh, the way that we deal with America's, <clears throat> excuse me, dependence on other countries for specific products and things that, um, you know, China has saber rattled a bit in the past few weeks, making comments about um, that they could shut down our access to certain uh, medical supplies. Um, so Admiral Moore Craven, I'll start with you on that. Yeah, I, I think uh, kind of to quote Tom Friedman, the world's a very flat place. So any thoughts that we can go it alone or that we can do business without the, uh, the global actors, uh, I think, is, uh, is a mirage. But the fact of the matter is we're going to have to all understand how the supply chains work. Or we're going to continue to get goods uh, and services from China, from Russia, from, uh, you know, from our friends and allies, and in some cases from our competitors. Um, I think we've got to make sure that we have the proper uh, quality control in place so that if we're getting pharmaceuticals uh, from China, uh, do we know that those pharmaceuticals meet the standards that, uh, that uh, we expect in the United States? Uh, but, but I believe that the supply chains, I don't actually think they will be fundamentally changed as a result of this pandemic. I think there will be a little bit more scrutiny on them. I think we will begin to realize that, uh, again, hard to go it alone when parts uh, that go into your iPhone, that go into your ventilator, that go into your car, come from uh, you know, places that most people can't even find on the map. So, so at the end of the day, uh, we have to make sure that uh, you know, we have uh, essentially, uh, again, I think a free trade environment, but with the quality control necessary to ensure that the goods that are coming in uh, meet the expectations of the U.S. consumer. Admiral Savridis, we hear from so many people, they in this moment are growing to really love the idea of made in America, but we know that there are so many ripple effects and implications from that, not the least, least of which is you know, cost and labor and all kinds of things. Um, do you think that there will be a change in how things are made or procured by the U.S.? Shannon, first of all, we ought to recognize this is a constant discussion in American history. We're a blessed country of massive size and scale with huge oceans on either side and benign neighbors to the north and south. It is very tempting to say we can grow it here, we can manufacture it here, we can construct it here. We've got all the protection in the world. Why don't we just kind of go it alone? It would be a mistake. And history tells us that. And I'll give you an example of it. It happened right about 100 years ago in the middle of the Spanish influenza. Uh, coming off of World War I, the United States was very frustrated with the world. And we said, let's just bring everything back to the United States. This is 1919, 1920. Uh, and let's not get involved in Europe. And let's not support that crazy organization, the League of Nations, the predecessor to the United Nations. Let's just come home. And we built walls. They were trade barriers, the Hawley Smoot tariffs. That was the way we were going to protect American goods. How'd that work out? Well, we cracked the global economy. We had a Great Depression. You can drop a plumb line to the rise of fascism in the Second World War. It's not going to work. So I'm with Bill McRaven, which is to say, we have to connect to the world. It is the only sensible way. It is not realistic to say we're just going to come home and do this by ourselves. I'll close by saying this is another example of one of those false choices for leaders. This is not a choice between isolationism, and we just do everything here, and completely being that global uh, bleed over where everything is internationalized. There are smart positions you can take. And I do think coming out of this crisis, we will look at uh, medical supply chains. We will look at pharmaceuticals in a way that we did not look at those supply chains prior to this pandemic. That makes sense to do so. I think electronics will be the same. And I think my earlier comments on cybersecurity will kind of reinforce that as well. So there'll be some new looks, but fundamentally, 
we're going to be involved in the world because it's the right place for the United States to be, in my view. Okay, we've got an audience question. I want to give you both a chance to answer. It says this, uh, Russian military jets delivered ventilators to the U.S., a declining and economically weak foe sending aid to its strategic adversary superpower. How do you describe that picture in one sentence? Admiral Stavridis, we'll start with you. Um, irrelevant to the general flow of geopolitics. And I'll elaborate on my one sentence, which is to say that um, it's Vladimir Putin trying always to show the people of Russia that Russia matters, that Russia is a significant power, but it's really not. And thus, it is not a significant move on the part of Putin. We shouldn't overinvest in it, nor should we be concerned about it. Um, we ought to just take the ventilators and run. Admiral McRaven? Yeah, I was going to say grandstanding, uh, because I think that is what Putin's doing. He's using this as a, a PR uh, campaign, as Jim said, to kind of motivate his base there in Russia, to let them know that, uh, that he is one up in the United States. Uh, but it is grandstanding and it will have little effect on, uh, on what's going on right now. I want to circle back to something that both of you talked about earlier about being a leader and you have to go into that room regardless of circumstances um, with your best face forward, your best, best foot forward. You have to be the leader who is positive and optimistic uh, no matter how dire the situation. So I know a lot of people listening in and watching today uh, are leaders in various ways in their organizations, their families, uh, their schools, their communities, places of worship. Um, so to both of you, I'd ask for a little bit of advice. When you are that leader and you have to go out there and expend that energy and rally the troops, literally, um, how do you as a leader then refill yourself, regenerate yourself, get your own strength back, encourage yourself so that you have what you need to move forward? Admiral McCraven, start with you. Yeah, you have to have a battle buddy, as we say in the military. Yeah, I was fortunate in my uh, three years as the commander of the Joint Special Operations Command, of which we were overseas. I was overseas most of that time. And then my three years as the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, uh, I had a great command sergeant major named Chris Ferris. And uh, Chris Ferris was uh, kind of one of the legends within Army Special Operations. He had, he had fought since he was about 18 years old. And so when those days came, when we had mass casualties, uh, helicopters go down, kids killed in combat, uh, errant strikes on, on innocent civilians where it just things just rip your heart out, uh, and particularly when you're dealing with you know, casualties and you have to go talk to the Rangers or the SEALs or the Army Special Operations guys, and you're just not up to it, you know, it would be Sergeant Major Ferris that would pull me aside and say, OK, boss, uh, game face on, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's go out there and, and make sure we're doing right by the troops. Because at the end of the day, my mission was to lead the men and women that worked for me. And Chris always made sure that I was in a position to do that. There were times when Again, you can't whine in front of the troops. You can't look upset in front of the troops. You can't look forlorn. But every once in a while, I could go in behind closed doors and, and I had somebody that would listen to me. Uh, and, and in light of the fact that I wasn't uh, at home uh, and, and have my wife that was my battle buddy at home, it was great having someone like, uh, like Sergeant Major Chris Ferris with me. So what I would offer to people out there is, look, you really can't go it alone. As a leader, you always have to look confident. You always have to put your game face on. But you also always need somebody, a close personal friend, a spouse, somebody that you can turn to, a colleague that you trust implicitly, and you know you can talk to them about the, the problems you're dealing with, uh, and then use them as a springboard then to go off and be a great leader. Admiral Stavridis, I, I find that um, close friends that I have that fit into that category, um, we're not having a bad day at the same time. I mean, there have been times through this crisis, uh, that COVID, where somebody's had a really bad day and needed to unload or needed some emotional support. Um, and luckily, that hasn't happened on the same day for us. So we're able to um, you know, build up our own spirits and feel tough enough and helpful enough so that when they need a hand, we've been able to offer it to each other. Um, any additional advice you would have for folks who uh, are watching in today who have to put on that brave face um, on how they can take care of themselves? Absolutely. Um, I'll add to what Admiral McRaven said by mentioning mentor. Um, I think most of us have developed mentors in our lives. Someone I've always looked up to, for example, is Admiral Mike Mullen, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He had been a company officer at the Naval Academy when he was in his 20s and I was a young midshipman. Um, he was instrumental at many points in my career. I think being able to reach out to a mentor 
in a moment like that can be very, very helpful. Number two, and you just mentioned it, you said it beautifully, Shannon, it, it's really, it's that peer network. So for me, another combatant commander that I could pick up the phone and call was General Jim Mattis, someone I've known also for uh, 15 or 20 years, and someone who's absolutely a peer, fellow uh, combatant commander. I was commander of NATO while he was commander of US Central Command. Uh, he was someone I could call and, and kind of laugh with and you'd let your hair down a little bit. Um, that peer, pure peer is very important. And third and finally, I find solace and renewal of spirit in reading, in reading books, looking at others who have experienced very challenging times, finding inspiration, finding practical ideas. At the moment, I'm reading a book by Eric Larson called um, uh, The Splendid and the Vile. It's a very interesting title, The Splendid and the Vile. It's about Winston Churchill, in the first year of his prime ministership during the blitz when thousands of Londoners were being killed on a nightly basis. Kind of reminds me of COVID in a certain sense. Um, so look to history. You can find examples in reading both fiction and nonfiction that can inspire you and replenish that well. But I wanna conclude on this by saying it's hard. It's easy to be on this webinar and say, yeah, the business is tanking, square your shoulders and get in there, it's hard. And I recognize it's hard. All the things we're telling you are ways you can deal with it, but it is very hard and very challenging. I have deep respect for anybody in a leadership position today. Yeah, Admiral Stavridis, I, I found it interesting when I was reading about your background about the fact that you had been uh, in a command position during cholera outbreaks in Haiti. And I was curious to know if there's anything specifically from those experiences that you think is helpful now. Um, pretty much what we've talked about in terms of the way you see the U.S. military stepping in and being helpful to the civilian population, um, that use of the military constructively in humanitarian ops. Number two is allies. Um, in Haiti, we had terrific support from the Brazilians, from the Chileans, from the Argentinians. Look to your allies and partners. And thirdly, interagency cooperation. What's really crucial is not loading up the Department of Defense and pointing it like a missile to go solve a problem. It's putting it together with your diplomats and State Department, USAID, the Agency for International Development, Department of Justice, um, Department of Homeland Security, getting that interagency together, that whole of government approach uh, that the administration is talking about. Um, that was something that helped a great deal in Haiti. So those would be the three things I would mention. And as we're about to wrap up, we thank you both again so much for your time. It's been very inspiring, I think, for me and hopefully for all the folks watching. But I want to give you a chance to give us a final word if there's anything you didn't touch on or things that you think would be additionally helpful. Uh, we'll start with you, Admiral McRaven. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Uh, let me echo what, uh, what Jim said. Uh, you know, all of us in the military have uh, read uh, Carl von Clausewitz, and, and he wrote the seminal book on war. Clausewitz has this great quote about on war, and he said, everything in war is easy. It's just the easy things are hard. Everything in war is easy. It's just the easy things are hard. I remember I was heading back to Afghanistan in, in 2009, and I was reading a couple of articles from some uh, notable PhDs uh, from some Ivy League schools, and they said, you know, the United States military just doesn't get it. If they would only build roads in Afghanistan, we could win the war. And I was like, well, no kidding. It's just that it's hard to build roads when people are shooting at you and blowing you up. And that's what leadership is about. It's easy, as Jim said, we could sit up here and get up on a whiteboard and say, let me tell you how, to, how you need to lead. You know, you need to lead from the front. You need to be men and women of great integrity. Uh, you, you need to you know, not have a bad day, but that is hard. Everything in leadership is easy. It's just that the easy things are hard. And that's why when you look at the ones that do it well, uh, they are admired greatly. And so, uh, again, we, we hope that, uh, that uh, some of the lessons we were able to present today are, are of some value to the listeners. Uh, it's been great to be here. Shannon, thank you very much for hosting this. Jim, as always, great to be with you, my friend. Final word to you, Admiral Stavridis. Um, well, thank you, Admiral Bill. Great to see you as well, and much love to George Ann. Um, let me, because I'm Greek American, I'm required to get a Greek reference in everything. Um, I'm going to go back um, 2,500 years ago. The Persians are attacking the ancient Greeks, and the Spartans send 300 warriors 
up to a, a, a small mountain pass at a place called Thermopylae. This is all told beautifully in the novel Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. And at that battle, um, the, the Spartans talk about how difficult their task is. Everything Bill McRaven just said, how, how this is pure combat. And there's a conversation between two of these Greek Spartan warriors, and I'll close with what they said. One of them is saying that uh, on the battlefield is the opposite of fear. It must be courage. And the other Spartan says, no, on a battlefield as in life, the opposite of fear is not courage. The opposite of fear is love. It is love for others. It is love for your team. It is love for your country. I think if we understand that, if we can empathize with our countrymen in this situation, if we can have that corona kindness, then each of us can be what Napoleon said, a dealer in hope. That would be my closing quote. A leader, and all of you are leaders, can be a dealer in hope. Thank you. Well, along with inspiration and practical information, I have a new reading list because of you two. I've been taking notes. Uh, that we'll all be equally informed and inspired by great leadership out there. Admiral Stavridis, Admiral McRaven, thank you so much. And to Washington Speakers Bureau, thank you for putting this together. And to everyone who's joined today, uh, God bless you. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you all. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone.